Let's uh, go ahead and get started. I'll pray for us. Father, I pray that you help us today. Um, your word tells us how the Lord Jesus opened the minds of the disciples to understand the scriptures, and we pray that you would open our minds to understand the scriptures today. I pray you help us get a glimpse of the elegance of your word, of the promise of your word, of the hope that uh, lies for those who sins are forgiven in Christ and who have been made beneficiaries of the new covenant and the promises that you've given in the new covenant. I pray that you give us as your people uh, today, uh, every single one of us who's repented of our sins and turned uh, to you, believing in the Lord Jesus. I pray that you cause every single one of us to, to be transformed um, even through uh, so ordinary a thing as a college lecture. Uh, would you do this uh, for the sake of Jesus? For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. So we're going to look today at the Mosaic Covenant we're going to look at the law, the Ten Commandments, um, what the law means for Christians, and we can start off no better place than what Paul says in Romans 7, and that is that the law is spiritual. Uh, it's not that there's something wrong with the law. Who would not want to live in a society where people love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, and with all their strength, and loved uh, each person because that person is made in the image of God uh, as they deserve to be loved. Who would not want to live in a society like that? The problem is not with the law. The problem is with me. The problem is with you. The problem is with every single person who is a natural uh, offspring of Adam because we are flesh and we're sold under sin. And so the law, instead of bringing life as it should bring life, it brings curse. And so we want to look at today how we should think through biblically uh, the law and so I've entitled this talk, The Mosaic Covenant in the Deuteron Deuteronomistic History. Um, if we had had time, we would look and see how uh, the Deuteronomistic history is in many ways a, a rehearsal of the failure of people to live up to God's uh, revelation in the law. So let's uh, dive in. The main points I want to make today, one is that Jesus, as the uh, new Moses, is uh, implementing the law. He's bringing the law, but he's doing it in a way differently than Moses did it. And so we'll, we're going to compare and contrast Jesus and Moses and uh, the, how they bring about the law. We're going to look at Moses' disobedience versus Jesus' obedience. I wish I had time to develop uh, this more, uh, this explains why Moses, as he's partially obeying God, is met by the angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord almost kills him, almost kills him because he's not been perfectly obedient. To, to be the Lord's leader, uh, God wants us to see that he's expecting perfect obedience, and Moses never had that, not even one second of his life. Then we're going to look at exactly what are the Ten Commandments, what are they in order. Uh, I believe uh, in terms of the final exam, one of the questions on the final exam is what uh, are the Ten Commandments and uh, put them in order. Um, we're going to look at how the Mosaic Covenant uh, requires perfect obedience, just like the Garden of Eden required perfect obedience, and just like in 
the eschaton, the eschaton requires a perfect conformity to the will of God. If you're an adulterer in the eschaton, you get thrown out of heaven. If you're a liar, if you're a coward, you get thrown out of heaven. And so how in the world are we to think about uh, salvation by God's grace alone through Jesus' life and death alone with this other stuff in the Bible that's pointing to this perfect obedience? How do we uh, look at that? We'll look at perfect obedience in Eden. We'll look at perfect obedience in the eschaton. We'll look at Jesus in perfect obedience. How uh, the only one... um, who ever lived uh, in complete conformity to God's revealed will, the only person who ever did that uh, was Jesus. Uh, And then Jesus granting his people perfect obedience, what that means. So you've seen this slide before. You can understand the Bible is a grand chiasm of being driven out of the Garden of Eden and then... uh, going back into the Garden of Eden. And you can see that one sin gets you kicked out of Eden. In the same way, one sin under the Mosaic Law means that a person should suffer ultimate penalty. Think of the guy who picks up sticks on the Sabbath. Uh, How many times did he break that law? He did it one time, and he was stoned. How many times did Moses rebel against God? One time, and he was excluded. And so the purpose of the law is there isn't anything wrong with the law. There's a problem with me that I really don't want to obey the law. I don't want to do what God says. I'm not conformed to God's will. Jesus is the perfect God man as the second Adam comes and he lives under his own law, never sins once in thought, word, or deed, uh, fully uh, fulfills the law. He loves the Lord his God with all his soul, heart, soul, mind, and strength. Even when uh, God the Father asked uh, Jesus to give up his life, Jesus said, in terms of my human nature, I don't want to do this. But he says, yet not my will, but yours be done. He's recapitulating Adam. He's recapitulating the Mosaic Covenant. And he's being obedient. And then the difference between Jesus and Moses is that Jesus can take that obedience that he's earned and he can conform us to his will Uh, when we see jesus will be like him uh, be transformed into the same image jesus is perfectly obedient to god if we're transformed into the same image of jesus we'll be perfectly obedient to god we'll be untemptable by evil so the whole sweep of scripture is getting people back to the garden of eden but it isn't just back to the garden of eden with a second chance it's back to the garden of eden with a new heart a new heart that wants to obey god that wants to conform to god's will and that is perfectly formed uh, to god's will so uh, that's kind of the outline of where we're going in all this Uh, let's dive in and look at the contrast between moses and jesus I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but both Moses and Jesus, uh, a wicked king tried to kill them. Uh, so in Exodus 1:16, Pharaoh said, when you serve as a midwife to the Hebrew women, uh, see them on the birth stool, if it's a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. The purpose there was to obliterate the nation of Israel by killing all the children. When that didn't work, um, Pharaoh dictated that uh, all the male children be thrown in the Nile River and uh, they would be drowned or eaten by crocodiles. The same thing happens with Jesus. Uh, Herod, who in many ways is functioning as the wicked Pharaoh, uh, then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under according to the time that he had ascertained for the wise men. In other words, uh, and the scriptures talk about uh, weeping in Ramah, which I think is about seven miles away from 
um, where this happened, what Herod decided to do is he couldn't kill Jesus. He decided to kill all the male children. And then his offspring uh, ratified that, and it was implemented by the uh, uh, by humanity and by the Romans. So there's a parallel between a wicked king uh, trying to kill Moses and a wicked king trying to kill uh, Jesus. Uh, Jesus and Moses are alike in that. And you think about how horrific uh, making the moms throw throw their own children and wa- uh, children in the Nile and watching them uh, be drowned and be eaten and then think about the wickedness of a man who's killing seven square miles of people with uh, children and God takes great offense to that uh, God uh, will by no means leave the guilty unpunished that's what he said and uh, it was a wicked thing he he knew it was going to happen and he punished uh, Pharaoh uh, for it. He had Pharaoh throw himself in the Red Sea and and he was drowned. And then uh, Herod was uh, was killed in a, a miserable, uh, horrific uh, way. I, I think the scriptures may talk about he was uh, eaten with uh, worms. Uh, God took great offense to this. But these two stories bring forward the fact that uh, there's a parallel between Uh, Moses and Jesus we look at the same thing um, with Exodus uh, 19.3 Moses going up on a mountain and he goes up on the mountain to meet with God and uh, God gives him the law and then Moses explains the law to Israel and Jesus does that same thing he goes to the top of a mountain he calls his Uh, disciples uh, to him in many ways those disciples represent true Israel they have some of the names of the Israelite uh, tribes and so Jesus is expounding the law on top uh, of a mountain the difference is Moses uh, at first wrote the laws on tablets of stone and then when he was so disgusted with Israel's lack of obedience, he broke the law and um, uh, the the one that God had written with his own finger. And then uh, God made Moses cut out a stone, uh, haul it up an 8,000 foot mountain. And then he wrote the law a second time. Well, Jesus uh, is expounding the law, but Jesus as the superior Moses is taking away our hearts of stone and he's going to give us a heart of flesh he's going to write the law on our hearts he's going to give us the law in a way uh, where it perfectly reveals what god wants in the world but the difference is he's going to enable us uh, eventually to fully follow the law to walk in his ways there's a contrast between where the law was given in the old testament this is Mount Sinai. Uh, I wish I could have gotten a little better picture of this, but uh, this is the most miserable place you could ever imagine. It's out in the mis- middle of the desert. Uh, hardly anything grows there. Uh, it's a craggy rock. Um, it's just short of 8,000 feet above sea level, if you want to know how big that is. If you can imagine Lookout Mountain uh, in Chattanooga, I think Lookout Mountain's about 2,000 feet, so uh, quadruple that and you get Mount Sinai. Um, It's a craggy, rocky place. Uh, Sinai, there's a debate what it uh, means. I I think it means something like my thorns. Uh, Sin is uh, related to the word, uh, sin in Hebrew is related to the word thorns. Sinai is the uh, plural construct. uh, Uh, first person my thorns the other name for this place is Mount Horeb um, which Horeb in uh, Hebrew is the word uh, sword and uh, that same three uh, letter root uh, Harav is related to the word destruction so if you want to 
understand what is this place. This is Thorn Mountain. It's Mount Destruction. It almost sounds like Lord of the Rings, doesn't it? Uh, like Mount Doom. And uh, I, I wonder if that isn't God's intent. Uh, think about the uh, over a million people, perhaps two million people here at the foot of this mountain. The top of the mountain is on fire. Moses is getting the law uh, and bringing it to the people. God says, even if anything touches this mountain, it's to be put to death. The mountain is so holy. Here's another picture from the Erdman's Companion to the Bible where you get the kind of stark nature of this place. Uh, if you've ever been out in New Mexico and in the heat and when you walk there and the dust just kind of boils uh, up, this is a very similar uh, situation. And you compare that where, with where Jesus gives his Sermon on the Mountain. I mean, do you, do you notice a contrast between those two places? I mean, one looks like a place of death, and the other is this uh, verdant, uh, green, life-giving, uh, beautiful place uh, overlook, there on the mountains overlooking the Sea of Galilee. I can't think of a more inviting uh, place than this, and this is where Jesus uh, expounded the law, uh, went through the law and so you see the contrast that there's nothing wrong with the law the law is good the law is spiritual the difference is Moses gave the law but he couldn't give a new heart he could only give the external requirements of the law and so the external requirements of the law become a curse for those uh, it's do this and live and there's nothing wrong with the law but the problem is there's something massively wrong with me. Uh, I don't want to obey God's law. I'm not in love with obeying God's law. And so because the law is good, but there's something wrong with me, the law at Mount Sinai is just a memory of thorns and exclusion and death and destruction. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to give the law. Uh, don't think I've come to abolish the law but I'm going to give the law in a way that is going to bring you life. And so that's what we want to look at uh, some this morning. Another way that we can compare uh, Moses and Jesus is they both led an exodus. So Moses, it says in Exodus 3, 7, Then the Lord said, I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Can you hear the Edenic uh, echoes in that phrase? To the place that currently is overrun by those having given themselves over to sexual sin, that is the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And I love that the word Amorite there means the talkers, the people who talk a good talk. I'm going to give you that land. It's been overrun. It, in some ways, the uh, land, uh, promised land is, is some kind of earthly representation of the Garden of Eden, but it's overrun by sinners. And God says, I'm going to give you that land back. And Moses, you're my guy. Uh, lead this exodus. And what God gets in return is a series of arguments, uh, reasons why it won't work. Moses saying no. Moses saying pick someone else. Finally, Moses uh, kind of obeys, but he was meant to lead an exodus. Then in the New Testament, we hear in uh, Luke 9, when the description is of the Mount of Transfiguration, it says, and behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah. Now, Moses and Elijah have a couple of things in common, uh, maybe three things in common in the Bible. One is they both see God on top of Mount Sinai. Uh, Moses uh, did that twice. He saw God on the top of Mount Sinai. Elijah did that once. Uh, they both fast 40 days. And they're both the kind of prophet 1.0 in the, 
in that Moses gives way to uh, the super Moses Joshua and Elijah gives way to the super prophet Elisha. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his, and then the ESV translate this, his departure. And it means departure. That's a fair translation. But you tell me, you don't even have to know Greek to know what this word is. They were talking to him about his, how would you say that word? His ex hados. Have you heard that word somewhere before in the Bible? Uh, they're speaking about the ex hados, the way out, uh, which he was about to fulfill in Jerusalem. I am so frustrated with that translation in the ESV because what that translation does is take out of the hands of the English reader the ability to see the beautiful biblical theology of between what Jesus came to do and what Moses came to do. Uh, I, I wish, uh, and the ESV does have uh, Exodus in the footnote, but I, I think you should put Exodus in the main reading so that anyone, uh, to, even a child, can make the connection once we translate the actual word that is there. Jesus is accomplishing an exodus. Just as Moses led the people out of slavery at Passover, Jesus at Passover is going to free his people from slavery. Just as Moses is bringing them to a land flowing with milk and honey, Jesus will bring them to the ultimate land flowing with milk and honey in this new exodus. Moses is uh, going from Mount Sinai, which on this um, uh, map, which is uh, Nelson's uh, 3D uh, map book, is where this map came from, uh, going from number 8 uh, to uh, number 10, uh, going into the land flowing with milk and honey. Uh, Jesus is not going from Sinai to earthly Israel. Jesus is going from slavery to sin to the ultimate land flowing with milk and honey, that holy of holies that's uh, in John's uh, vision, this grand cube, uh, half the size of the United States. We have a contrast too. Moses fails to bring the people in. Uh, Numbers uh, 33, 49, and they camp by the Jordan from Beth Jemish, uh, Beth Jeshemoth, as far as Abel Shatim in the plains of Moab. This is on the other side of the Jordan River. This is on the non-Israel side of the Jordan River. And remember how we said that every name in the Bible means something. Well, Abel Shatim means something. Abel means field of, and Shatim means thorns. How far can the lawgiver get you without a new heart? He can only get you to the field of thorns. He can only get you to the place where you hear the, the just requirements of the law and you say the law, I mean, it isn't unreasonable. These are pretty reasonable things that God is, is asking from us. But with a stony heart, I don't really want to do reasonable things. I want to do unreasonable things. And so Moses, even though there's nothing wrong with the law, as far as Moses can get, the people is the field of thorns. And then it says, so Moses died, according to the word of the Lord. He has the people in the field of thorns. He can't get them over the Jordan River until this really cool guy named Yeshua comes along and when Yeshua comes along Yeshua can take the people out of the um, uh, field of thorns into the land flowing with milk and honey that has to be God's intended foreshadowing of the ultimate Yeshua who would come in this story that is Jesus and it's interesting to me that um, when God meets 
Moses at Mount Sinai, or I'm going to call it Thorn Mountain or Mount Destruction, when God meets Moses at Thorn Mountain, do you recall in the story that he's in a thorn bush? Do you remember that, that it's a burning thorn bush? And then you ask yourself the question, doesn't God know that thorns come from the curse? Uh, thorns aren't a part of rigid creation, and God's in the midst of thorns, and fire is going everywhere, and he's talking about a land of flowing with milk and honey. That seems like the wrong place to be promising the restoration of the Garden of Eden until you realize that to make that promise good, Yahweh got into thorns a second time. Yahweh incarnate in the person of Jesus to make good his promise to Moses got into thorns a second time to throw up in the Garden of Eden. Jesus is different because Moses fails to bring the people in and Jesus succeeds. The text says, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being made holy. That's verbatim what that passage says in the original. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being made holy. I don't know about you, but for me, it wouldn't be good enough for God to give me a second chance. If God gave me a second chance and put me in the Garden of Eden and just said, you know how it worked out in the past, don't do that again, I would mess that up. I know me. I know what I'm like. A second chance wouldn't do it for me. I need more than a second chance. I need a new heart that's made perfect by God. And what Jesus is promising in this conformity to the will of God is that. He has perfected. He has made perfect. He has made complete for all time those who in this life are being sanctified. Are they completely sanctified now? No. Are they made perfect before God for all time? Yes. Philippians 1.6 says, Paul says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God isn't creating a second chance so that in heaven we can kind of do the temptation all over again. God's creating a way that's going to make us untemptable by evil. We're going to be conformed to the will of God, but we're going to be conformed in a way that it's going to be impossible for us to sin. And it's going to be impossible the same way it's impossible for Jesus to sin. Because Jesus looks at sin and says, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. That's what God uh, is, is doing. That is God, what God is promising uh, for us. Just uh, take a little rest here and give an example. Um, I know most people have um, sin that they regularly uh, get tripped up by. Uh, uh, maybe it's lust, maybe it's anger, maybe it's uh, uh, just being full of yourself. But for most people, there there's a sin that just uh, trips you up over and over again. And for most people, there are also other sins that just hold no temptation whatsoever uh, uh, for you. Uh, for me, there are plenty of sins that uh, uh, I struggle with. Uh, one sin that I don't uh, particularly struggle with and never have really struggled with is uh, the sin of gambling. I just don't get gambling. Uh, it may be because I'm just too tight with my money, you know, but I just don't get gambling. It just has no appeal uh, to me. And a few summers ago, I was taking a, a trip uh, down the Grand Canyon um, 
and uh, I, I like to just drive. So instead of flying out to Las Vegas, I decided to drive out to Las Vegas. And it was a great thing. If I wanted to stop and see something, I just stopped and uh, would see it. It took like a week to get out there. It was a great trip. I loved every minute of it. But you may know that uh, when you're going out there, you need to find a cheap place to stay. And uh, I didn't want to, uh, so somebody else paying for the trip, and I just didn't want to spend their money uh, just without uh, uh, being wise. And so I wanted to find the cheapest place I could. And you may know that the cheapest place that you can get a room usually is a casino. And the reason casinos will give you a room is because you buy the room and they know they're going to make 10 times that uh, back from the money that you lose at gambling. Well, listen, I could walk through a casino with my uh, pockets full of quarters the rest of my life and they're not going to get one red cent from me because I just, I don't get gambling. And so I would rent these suites at these casinos driving out to Las Vegas uh, and I'd rent them for next to nothing. I'd eat at the buffet, you know, all you could eat, buffet, steak, whatever, cost you nothing. And they lost so much money on me because I wasn't going to put one dime in one of those machines because I just don't get that. I just don't get gambling. Can you imagine the day coming where the sin that trips you up most in life, where you just look at that and you say, that's the stupidest thing I've ever, why in the world would I do that? That just makes no sense to me why would do that. That's what God's promising uh, in this transformation, in the total transformation uh, in Scripture. Justin Taylor uh, writes this, New Testament authors understood Jesus to be the culmination of the Old Testament. You have uh, Adam. Adam, can you follow this law? It's really easy. You're in a garden. Uh, you'll win uh, the garden for all your natural offspring, if you obey, can you do it? And Adam, no, I can't do it. God comes to uh, Moses in many ways. He's repeating the same deal that he made with Adam. If, if you follow the law, you get to stay into the land flowing with milk and honey. If you don't follow the law, the land will vomit you out, just like uh, Eden vomited uh, uh, Adam out. Jesus comes as the culmination, and Jesus has a law. Do this and live, and Jesus says, I will do this. And when you win, uh, your nature will be passed on to all your supernatural offspring, and your victory will become their victory. And so Jesus says, the true Adam, true Israel, the suffering servant, son of God, the faithful remnant, the ultimate prophet, the reigning king, the final priest, Jesus is the culmination of it all. So when we read about Moses giving the law at Mount Sinai, we're always to read that in light of Jesus giving the Spirit to the church on the day of Pentecost. I don't know if you know this, but uh, uh, the law was given at uh, Pentecost 50 days after Passover. The Spirit is given uh, 50 days. The law was given at Mount Sinai where uh, fire comes down on the top. Now people become the revelation of God's law. And fire comes down, but it doesn't consume uh, uh, people, uh, normal people like us who are plagued with sin. What we see then is all of this culminating in the person of Jesus. Jesus becoming the perfect Israel. God's people in God's place under God's rule. And anyone who comes... Believing on Jesus is grafted in, and Jesus will give them the benefits of the new covenant, which uh, includes total transformation and a heart that will obey God. Moses can only get the people here. Abel, Shatim, field of thorns. Joshua goes in, and he's driving out the sin sinners. Jesus has a different plan. Jesus comes to that place, and I don't know if you know this, but this is where uh, Jesus was baptized. His, historically, that's a, been the place since 100 AD that has marked where um, Jesus is baptized. If you, if you go to Israel today, there's a place about 60 miles north of that. 
has a handrail for $18. They'll rent you a robe. You can be baptized. They claim that's the place. That's not the place. That never was the place. This was the place. This was the place Joshua went in. This is the place Jesus went in. But Jesus, instead of driving out those wicked Canaanites, what Jesus does is he unites with sinners. And then on the cross, just like the Canaanite kings who hung on trees and, uh, till evening and then thrown into a cave, Jesus conquers the Canaanite flesh by becoming one with our flesh on the cross and then utterly putting it to death. That's foreshadowed with uh, this bronze serpent of Moses. And I don't know if you've ever seen this picture or not, but this is the place where uh, Moses died. This is the top of Mount Nebo in Jordan today. Uh, and you can stand at this place and uh, if in this picture, instead of looking straight into this picture, if you looked to the right in this picture, you would be looking across the Dead Sea and the, Rome, uh, and the Jordan River and 25 miles uh, so uh, from here to maybe Saudi Daisy, uh, if you were looking, you would see Jerusalem. In fact, you can stand right here and see Bethlehem. Uh, you can stand right here and see uh, where uh, Jesus interacted with the woman at the well. This is where Moses died because he couldn't go into uh, uh, restored Eden. Jesus does go into restored Eden. When he dies in the same way the Canaanite kings, uh, the immediate thing that happens is the curtain is rent, uh, torn in two, top to bottom. And I wish on this picture that there were cherubs embroidered. Uh, the uh, Old Testament says there are cherubs, and remember that cherubs are the entities uh, told to keep sinners out of the Garden of, of Eden. When Jesus died on the cross, he makes his people not sinners. And so the way into the restored cube of the Holy of Holies is opened, and the ultimate cube will be uh, Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem. This is what God's word says in Deuteronomy. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many of the nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, uh, Hivites, Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You will make no covenant with them. You will show them no mercy. You shall not intermarry with them, giving their daughters to your daughters to their son or taking their daughters for your sons. For they would turn away your sons from falling after me to serve other gods. And the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. Now the picture here is of God driving sinners out. And so God is saying, show them no mercy, drive them out. You, you want the Garden of Eden and you have the command just like uh, Adam and Eve to guard and keep it, to keep what's wicked out of it. And so in many ways, the, this Canaanite curse is recapitulating that uh, statement of driving the wicked people out of um, Eden. The problem is the, the people to whom that command was given are half Canaanites. Judah married a Canaanite uh, woman and then the children he had, he incestuously fathered children through one of their wives. He is so tied up with uh, Canaanite sin that he has the spear and God says, go kill the Canaanites. But the problem is he's an incestuous half Canaanite. How are we to understand that? In the meta narrative, we're all Canaanites. We're all the polluted offspring of Adam and Eve. We have all rebelled. We have all chosen things other than God, and we've gotten on the wrong path. 
And if God were to exterminate tomorrow at 12 o'clock all people who are wicked in the world, would we live or would be, we be exterminated by God? Clearly, unless we're absolutely perfect, we, we would be exterminated. This is drawing attention that God is trying to clean out Eden, but the problem is there's something wrong with me. Jesus, as the super Moses, says this exact same thing. Show them no mercy. Dry them out. Make no covenant with, with sinners. But the way Jesus implements this is by being the object of no mercy. He unifies with sinners. And then the Canaanite curse falls on Jesus. Jesus becomes the harem, the, the one devoted to destruction. And by taking that, uh, that punishment to the ultimate place, to death, he transforms the Canaanites into people who can live with God. He puts to death their fallen flesh and gives them new flesh. He gives them a new heart. Many people don't understand the whole sons of God, daughters of men thing, uh, but clearly the text is saying it's God's people marrying, intermarrying with Canaanites, but here's the elegance of it. There's only one son of God who can marry a daughter of Adam and not have her beauty turn his heart away from God. There's only one son of God who can pull that off, and it's the Lord Jesus. And he does it by winning the heart of his bride and transforming her into one who wants to obey God. And you think about that. The word Jesus in Greek, Eases, it isn't like the word Joshua or sort of near the word Joshua. It's exactly the word Joshua. It translates uh, two times in Acts and in Hebrew. The word Joshua, Eases in Greek, is the word Joshua. And then you start thinking, well, Joshua is the one who took Moses' place. And Joshua is the one who can take them in the land. And notice that God, when he picks the name Joshua and gives it to the angel to convey to Mary, the angel says to her, uh, this is to Joseph, who will convey it to Mary, uh, she will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people, his people, not from those wicked Canaanites, He'll save his people from their sins. Moses is all about outward stuff. Jesus is about inward uh, stuff. So can you see a little of the sweep of scripture here, how it's all related? How do you get the people back to the Garden of Eden? How do you get the woman back to the Garden of Eden? How do you get the woman to the place where she's untemptable by evil and God's solution is allowing the fall allowing evil allowing people to wickedly do horrible things and then conquering that evil by good and in conquering that evil becoming the way that the people are transformed into those conformed to God's image. So, having said all that, this is the Ten Commandments. And I might ask the question, what do you notice about the Ten Commandments right off the bat? And one of the things I notice about the Ten Commandments is some of them are really straightforward and some of them are really explained. Uh, some of them are just two words in Hebrew. Uh, others are like whole paragraphs. And so I want us to look at that. Look at uh, the ones we're told in terms of these two tables. And not everyone would divide them like this, but I divide them five and five, that five are about God and five are about people. 
uh, some do six and four, um, but let, let's look at them. How are those two tables of the law summarized? They're summarized this way. Love Yahweh with all your heart, soul, and strength, with your affection, uh, with your nefesh, which has something to do with the appetite, and then uh, love Yahweh with your strength is a really weird word in Hebrew. It's usually the word translated much uh, me'od, uh, love God with your muchness. When Jesus translates that, he translates that word me'od with uh, all your mind and all your strength. So he's, when Jesus uh, expounds the law, he comes to that third word in Hebrew, and he comes up with two words to translate it. But basically what the first table of the law is saying is Yahweh is a creator, Yahweh is good. Treat Yahweh the way he should be treated. Respond to him the way he should be responded to. And then the second table of the law, which we're going to see is um, a really terse uh, table. It's just two words. Most of them are just two words. Um, it's basically love everyone else as befits someone who's made in the image of God. Um, Jesus gives us the rule, love other people the same way you love yourself. Be concerned with every other person on the planet the exact same way that you're concerned about your own well-being. And if you do that, if you respond to uh, Yahweh that way, and if you respond to the people who are made in the image of Yahweh that way, then you fulfill the two tables of the law. That's the picture of what heaven is going to be like. Some people... Um, affirm it to Augustine and say um, heaven is a place where uh, we worship God, uh, love other people, and walk on gold. And the city of man is a place where we love gold and walk on people. I've never been able to find where that is in Augustine. It sounds like something Augustine would say. I've just never been able uh, to find it. Whoever did say it had an insight into something about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is going to be spectacular. But the kingdom of God is going to be bliss because the people who live there are going to be transformed people. They're going to be people who love God and who love other people. This is where those two ideas come from. Deuteronomy 6, 5, this is part of the Shema prayer that uh, Jews make twice, three times, four times a day. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. When Jesus uh, was asked, what's the greatest command? That's what he quoted. He said, that's the greatest one right there. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You'll teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up, you will bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be frontlets between your eyes. You will write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Love God. That's what, uh, that's what scripture says. Jesus said a second command is just like it. Love your neighbors yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and all the prophets and I might ask who would not want to live in a society like that where every single person who lived in that society treated you with great respect because you were made in the image of God and who felt like it was their duty in life to see that you flourish and who was doing all that out of a sense of the greatness of God. Who would not want to live in a place like that? 
This is what God says before he gives the Ten Commandments. This is a preface to the Ten Commandments. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. What God is saying is, look, I've been really good to you. You were slaves. There was someone over you who was getting rich at your pover- the expense of your poverty. You were headed nowhere in life. Your entire life was making bricks, throwing mud in a, a wood uh, form, uh, smoothing it off. That's what you were going to do every waking moment of your life for the rest of your life. And I rescued you out of that. I brought you out of that. I'm bringing you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Look, I've been really good to you. This is what I want you to live like. That seems like a pretty reasonable argument to me. God isn't saying, I want you to hold your breath for 17 years. God is making some really reasonable commands, and he starts it off by saying, this is why... Uh, this is why you should do it. That, that's interesting. I was preaching one time, and um, I made a what I felt like was a powerful point. And as I was saying it, if lightning didn't hit the church, it almost hit the church. I mean, it sounded like a bomb went kabam, you know, the whole building. And I didn't know what to say. I mean, is that like God pounding the pulpit for me or God telling me that, you know, what you're saying isn't quite right? But I don't know. Kind of kind of take that like uh, uh, this. Uh, I don't know. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery. I've been really good to you. This is how I want you to live. First commandment. Uh, You may want a paper Bible to open uh, up so you can follow along. Exodus uh, 22. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of uh, Egypt out of the house of slavery. The house of being slaves is what it says literally. That's the preface to um, the Ten Commandments. God is saying, uh, since I've been good to you, this is how I want you to respond. I may need to turn these on again. First command, you shall have no other gods uh, before me. What's interesting about that in Hebrew is this term before me in English that sounds like um, as long as God is number one then everything's good that's actually not what this is saying in Hebrew in Hebrew it says you will have no other gods uh, upon my face In other words, anywhere I can see, I don't want there another God to be in your life. Anywhere I can see. I want to be the only God. Commandment two. Whoa, look at that. It's like commandment one, pretty straightforward. Commandment two, crazy. This is unbelievable what God says here. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness or anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or that is in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them. You shall not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And that's not jealous in the sense of a petty jealousy. That is somebody's uh, trying to uh, seduce your wife and you go punch him in the next week that that's a righteous jealousy uh, someone's trying to uh, to mess with your family and you flip the table over 
uh, this God says, I am El Kana. I am the I am the God of jealousy. And then this must be the most terrifying thing. Uh, it says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. In other words, God's saying, look, I want to draw my own picture. I don't want you to draw the picture of what you think I should look like. I want to draw my own picture in Scripture, and I want that to be the picture that you have of me. And if you say, but I want to make you as a cow like the golden calf, because I can relate to the golden calf, God says, if you do that, you hate me. And I'll visit the iniquity, that iniquity, on the third and fourth generation. And you say, wow, that's, if I'm an idolater, I'm going to plague my children with idolatry. That sounds, that sounds so negative. But look at the next statement. But doing hesed, constantly doing covenantal faithfulness. And then the ESV here says to thousands to those loving me and those keeping my commandments. So you say, okay, three or four generations, but thousands of people uh, if you obey. It could mean that. The English could mean that. I don't think that's what the Hebrew means because in Deuteronomy uh, 7, 1, it cites this verse and it adds one word. It adds the word generations. Showing Hesed to a thousand generations. In other words, if you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, if you let God draw his own picture, he says 4,000 years from now, I'll be blessing people who come from your line. Does that sound like a pretty good deal to you? God wants to draw his own picture. You let God do that. 4,000 years from now, he'll be blessing people because you obeyed. That sounds like a pretty good deal to me. There is a consequence if you come to the Bible and you say, I just want to, I just want to get rid of the God in the Bible. I want to make the God so he looks like I want him to look. God said, if you do that, you hate me. Let me draw my own picture. Let me present myself in the word. And if you do that, if you follow that fully, I'll bless a thousand generations. You shall not take the, uh, this is the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold guiltless. And it's really weird in Hebrew to me. Uh this hold guiltless because the way it's written it uses a special um, they call them binions in Hebrew where if you want to talk about something intensely is done it's uh, it's called the P.A.L. when I've taught Hebrew before sometimes my students will say things like I'm hungry in the P.A.L. you know and uh, it's like I'm, I'm just so beyond hungry. Well, this is God cleansing us, holding us guilty, but it's in the PL. I will not massively cleanse someone who takes my name in vain. Uh, that's probably, it, in, it includes using God's word as a swear word, but more than likely what this means is claiming to be God's person and then living in a way inconsistent without, without claim. Have you ever, you know, uh, seen a merchant who has a fish on their back of their van and then cheats people? I've even heard people say before, I, I'm not sure I want to do uh, business with someone who is overtly Christian because... I think sometimes they'll use that to cheat me. 
Okay, that's profaning God's name. That's saying I'm God's person and then living in a way that's inconsistent. That's lifting up his name, Leshav, for nothing. Hebrew has a little vowel that makes no sound, uh, and it's called a shva, uh, a nothing, a little nothing sound. And God says, don't take my name, Leshav, for, for nothing. When you take my name on yourself, I want you to live like that means something in the world. Whoa, look at this. Four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And this one is in that PAL2 to make it massively holy. Remember the Sabbath day to make it massively holy. Six days you will labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a rest to the Lord you're gone on it you shall do no work you your son your daughter male servant female servant your livestock the sojourner who is within your gates why for six days the lord made heaven and the earth a sea and all that's in and he shabbathed he rested well he knowed uh he uh knowed on the seventh day therefore the Lord blessed the, the ceasing day, the Sabbath day, and he made it mega holy. That seems like a pretty reasonable command. Uh, that command is like Warren Buffett saying, tell you what, every Friday let's meet for lunch. You read this book. Uh, we'll meet for lunch for an hour. I'll tell you how to invest your money. Warren Buffett wouldn't be getting anything out of that. You would be getting everything out of that. God says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to work six days, but one day of the week I want you to set aside and I want you to rest. I want you to read my word. I want you to fellowship with me, and it's going to be good for you if you, you do that. That seems like a pretty reasonable command. Honor your father and your mother. And in Hebrew, uh, this this is the word kavod, make heavy, make important, make glorious your father and your mother so that your days be long in the land, in the Adama. Have you heard that word somewhere before? Uh, which the Lord your God is giving to you. Seems like a pretty reasonable command. God put you in a family. You should do everything you can to make those people important uh, you you should look at it as a blessing you shall not murder a lot of times this command is uh, listed thou shall not kill but that's not what the command says uh, Hebrew has a word for kill katal and that's not the word that's used here this says don't murder anybody I think the Bible is uh, thoroughly aware that there are times when uh, godly people are going to defend the helpless and the weak. Um, oh, if only Adam, when the serpent was uh, trying to seduce his wife, oh, if Adam had just reached back for the rock and just took it as I'm going to fight to the death to deliver my wife. Oh, if he had done that. Oh, if he had been bitten all over in the process. Do you think he would have won his uh, wife's heart if she was wavering whether or not to do this or not? Do you think she would be able to follow his lead? Instead, he was there silent. There are times when God knows that it, it, it's a godly thing to defend the widow and the orphan so the command isn't thou shall not kill the command is thou shall not unjustly kill which seems to uh, imply that there may be a circumstance where godly uh, people will defend jesus in matthew 5 when he expounds this this is an easy command don't murder anybody um, 
Jesus says, you've heard it said of old, do not murder. He quotes what the Bible says. And then he also quotes the addition, uh, how people explained it. Whoever murders will be liable to the judgment. Okay, fair enough. Don't murder anybody. But then Jesus adds this. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother, and this means unjustly, is liable to the judgment. Whoever insults his brother, and I think the word in Greek is the word moron there, like empty head, like idiot, like you call somebody that, are you treating them the way the image of God should be treated? And Jesus says, if you're not treating them the way the image of God is being treated, then you're actually violating this command, thou shalt not murder. Jesus is interpreting these commands much more broadly than we would. Uh, Commandment 7, you shall not commit adultery. Two words, you will not do this. Jesus says, you've heard it said, again, uh, Matthew 5, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Well, how serious should you take that kind of lust? Jesus says, take it this serious. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away from you. Act like it was a bomb about to blow you up. Sin is coming in this. How serious should you take this command? Throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than the whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go to hell. And then Jesus doesn't stop. He knew people were going to have a problem with this. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her Certificate of divorce. He's quoting Deuteronomy 24 there. Valid command in the Old Testament. But Jesus said, I say to everyone who divorces his wife, except for on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. In other words, Jesus is saying, if you're a man and you divorce your wife, and that causes your wife, your former wife, to go into sexual sin, Jesus says, you've broken the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. In other words, not only do thoughts count, Jesus is saying the way your actions impact another person count. Do you think a woman who dresses in a provocative way that causes a man to lust after her, do you think that would fall under what Jesus is saying here? Jesus is saying thoughts count, the way your life impacts others count. Jesus is saying, I want these laws followed. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. And then, oh my goodness, the beauty of this command. Don't covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, female servant, ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. It's really interesting to me that before the 40 years in the wilderness that the house is put before the wife. It's funny to me too when Moses, who wrote these laws down, when he quotes it in Deuteronomy, he reverses that order. They're about to inherit massive wealth. And so when he listed in Deuteronomy, he says, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. The problem isn't with the law. The problem is with the hard-heartedness. 
Moses can't bring us to conformity with God's law. God maybe knew that men were going to objectify women. God knew it was wrong. It was never his intent. His intent, the Garden of Eden, one man, one woman together for life as emperor and empress of the universe. Sin ruined that. God is fixing it. And God is restoring. And God is making the Eden, the restored Eden, where you're never going to covet. You're never going to begrudge the good things that God has given someone else, wishing ill on them. Paul says this about coveting. What shall we say then is the law of sin? By no means. Then he says of himself, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you should not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I think he's, uh, what he's talking about here is uh, something a little like what happened to me at the dentist one time. Um, when I was a, a small child, I had a horrible accident where my front teeth were uh, knocked in. And uh, when that happened, um, it damaged the nerves in my teeth. Um, and they didn't grow right. Uh, in fact, over time, they died. But uh, when I was born, I was born with uh, extraordinarily um, strong teeth. One dentist said, you'll never get a, a cavity in your life. I'm not sure that's the best thing to tell a kid, but that's what the dentist told me, your teeth are just hard. Well, eventually I did get a cavity uh, and had that glorious experience of having a root canal and uh, Oh my goodness, it's like, just kill me now, right? Uh, and when they were examining my teeth, the way they were deciding if there was something wrong is they, if you ever been to the dentist and they do this, they take that thing that becomes really cold and they'll put it on your tooth. And if your tooth is healthy and they do that, you'll come up out of the chair because it's just a shooting pain that will just, they touch it to your tooth and it just, instantly that nerve goes into overdrive but if that nerve's dead they can touch that thing to your tooth and you'll never feel anything and i remember the dentist did that on the uh, one of the teeth that i had to have a root canal in and i didn't feel a thing and he said you want to feel what it's like without it and uh, i should have never said yes but he put it on the other one and it's like oh my goodness well that one had a nerve that would work and the other one uh, didn't the law is like that. The law, there's nothing wrong with the law, but it reveals, the law reveals something wrong with us. Jesus says, don't think I came to abolish the law or the province. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. There are many people who start embracing the doctrines of grace and then they'll start saying things like, if you say anything about the law, you're just into legalism. And they'll say things like, you just need to go out and sin uh, because Jesus died for all your sins and, and you just need to go sin. That's called being a libertine. Um, that's a misunderstanding what Jesus is teaching. Don't think I've come to abolish the law. I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. There is a transformation that happens that is always going to be better than the outward righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. And then stunningly, Jesus says, you've got to be perfect. And Revelation talks about uh, people in heaven. As for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, for murderers, sexually immor immoral people, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. 
their portion would be in the lake that burns with fire, which is the second death. Now, I don't know about you, but about right now, I'm starting to have, like, I can feel my blood pressure going up, and it's like, okay, Jesus is talking about being perfect. I know I'm not perfect. How in the world can this be good news? This is how it's good news. Before Jesus said, you must be perfect, he said, blessed are the spiritually bankrupt. What do you need to be right with God? You need to be spiritually bankrupt. To realize there's no way I can ever conform to the will of God. There's no way I can ever obey the will of God. I need the transformation. That's why Paul can say there is now near no condemnation for those who are in Jesus for the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could never do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He condemns sinful sin in the flesh and then notice what he says. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. That's exactly what the new covenant promises. I will sprinkle you with clean water. I will cleanse you. I'll give you a new heart. We're going to look at this passage, this glorious passage, more in the future. I will remove your heart of stone. I will put my, I will cause you to carefully obey my statutes. You will dwell in the land. You'll be my people. I'll be your God. What Jesus is doing is this. He's taking away our heart of stone. And he's giving us a new heart. A new heart that will be persuaded and enable to walk in the ways of God. That's the good news. And that's what we're going to look at in the future. I'll see you on Thursday.